for us. It's, I, I cannot tell you, honestly. I welcomed- Hi, Carolyn. My- Interestingly enough, we just started up, actually. Please, please start up again. Well, okay. Good morning, <laughs> Dr. Rosensweet. Good morning, Carolyn Shapiro and all the women on ins and outs of menopause. And maybe there's some men too. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was just going to say, like, just this morning, I welcomed 91 women to the group. And I welcomed, like, 74 the day before. I don't know. Anyway, I keep welcoming and welcoming and welcoming. And I think that's so exciting because our village, right? is really growing and women can get the help that they need. Hi, Elaine. Good morning. Um, so as always, Dr. Rosen Sweet, whether I see you once a week, twice a week, once a year, it's always good to see you. Mm-hmm. And you we're too, all, oh, thank you. We're very grateful to have you, the team. Thank you, Andre. I have a list of questions here. Um, Ladies, welcome. We are doing this every Tuesday and every Thursday, 7 a.m. PST, 10 a.m. EST. I will go ahead and write down the questions that have been written to me and ask Dr. Rosensweet for about the first half hour. And then you guys, please feel free to come on up, ask your questions, and Dr. Rosensweet will answer them. And uh, we're going to all feel well. (laughs) I can't think of anything better than that, right? Nothing like answering questions to him. I know. Feel well. your, your favorite, favorite thing to do. All right. So the rule is I always get to ask the first question because I'm All doing right. this. So uh, I don't want to make it too complicated. However, you're very, very familiar with um, sex hormone binding globulin. In other words, SHBG which many women don't really know what that is, but many do. And it's terribly confusing. And so my question is, um, can you explain how it is that working with um, an elevated sex hormone binding globulin might be tricky when really, to my knowledge, and I might not know that well, um, sex hormone binding globulin, globulin is kind of the body's way of protecting us am i wrong or well i can i'd I'd like to explain it uh what exactly sex hormone binding globulin is please and ovarian hormones and other hormones are really fat soluble they're not water soluble and when the ovary excretes them for example they go into the bloodstream and they can't travel around the bloodstream like a fat globule. They right. have to be bound up to serum proteins and that's how they're transported around the human body, bound to serum proteins. It's a miracle. And you know, one of a zillion miracles of how our bodies really function. Right. And sex hormone binding globulin is one of several proteins that anything that's fat soluble and especially the hormones is transported. And so, for example, when estriol and estradiol are excreted by the ovary, they're taken up in the bloodstream by sex hormone binding globulin. It's part of a natural process. And if there's too much Um, ovarian hormones for some reason the sex hormone binding globulin is sort of then starts behaving as a protective mechanism so it's got two functions one is transport the sex hormones around and the second one is if there's an excessive amount of ovarian hormones or thyroid hormone for some reason then it'll the amount of sex hormone binding globulin in the blood will increase to bind up the excessive amounts of hormones because hormones are so strong, we don't want excessive amounts of hormones. Um, They're usually problematic. And so, um, interestingly enough, when young women were given the birth control pill, Mm. here you are, you're a young woman, you're at the height of your ovarian hormone output and uh, you're getting some extra estrogen coming in through the birth control pill. 
my goodness, um, the body does not appreciate that and protects itself from the extra estrogen. So young women very commonly on the birth control pill, their bodies produce extra sex hormone binding globulin and it binds up the excessive amounts of the hormones coming in through the birth control pill. It also binds up other hormones called testosterone, for example. And there's a significant number of young women who went onto the birth control pill who lose their libido because of that binding. So <laughs> ordinarily- I guess they get pregnant then, right? Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's an upside to that. Um, <laughs> and yet <clears throat> it was one of the reasons that I was concerned early on about the birth control pill. And ordinarily, when you stop taking the birth control pill and there's no longer a need to mop up the extra um, ovarian hormones, then the sex hormone binding globulin declines to normal. And uh, in second. So that's the usual thing that happens. And then oddly enough, there's many women who are entering into menopause that um, they start, their, their process isn't so easy. And we, because we know the sex hormone binding globulin can be a problem, it's mandatory in the menopause method that be a, prior to any hormone administration, we get a serum sex hormone binding globulin just to see what their level is. And especially when I see something on their questionnaire that says, did you ever take the birth control pill? Yes, I did. I mean, that's just an added reason to get it, but we always get it routinely anyway. And interestingly enough, some women enter menopause with an elevated sex hormone binding globulin. And the only way that that could have happened is from them taking the birth control pill. And you know, I've seen it as um, as significant and uh, that a woman took it for six months when she was 20, she didn't really like the pill. And she stopped taking the pill and that sex hormone binding globulin elevated and it stayed elevated. Oh my God. Well, I don't ever announce to a woman when we see an elevated sex hormone binding globulin as she enters menopause, that that's going to be a problem. It may not be. We proceed with our treatment as usual. And sometimes it's inconsequential that the sex hormone binding globulin is is a little elevated. Now there's other things that can elevate the sex hormone binding globulin. If a woman is on too much hormones, well, yeah, that means too much ovarian hormones. That means estradiol, testosterone. Those are the more common ones. Estriol, even um, it, it even binds progesterone, but I've never seen it elevated because of progesterone. But it can, and also thyroid hormone. Thyroid binds primarily to thyroid binding globulin. It's not, it's fat soluble as well. It needs to be transported around by serum proteins. But the main one that binds it is thyroid binding globulin. But someone who's on too much thyroid hormone, oh my, they're going to, the sex hormone binding globulin is going to mop up some of it. So I've seen women who were on too much thyroid hormone get an, a sex hormone, elevated sex hormone binding globulin. So whenever we're tracking down a problematic elevated sex hormone binding globulin, we're looking at four thyroid blood tests, free T3, free T4, TSH, and reverse T3. And so these are the things that can elevate the sex hormone binding globulin. And you hope when you correct the excessive hormone that got it there, that it's going to back down and it won't be a problem. Again, and sometimes mild elevations of sex hormone binding globulin aren't a problem. And sometimes significant elevations of sex hormone binding globulin are a problem. And we always hope to find the culprits or culprit that is raising the sex hormone binding globulin, correct it, and it'll come down. And a lot of times it does. And sometimes it doesn't. And when that sex hormone binding globulin does not come down, just by normalizing levels of thyroid, estrogens, testosterone, progesterone, oh my, then we there is a pharmaceutical medication is the only effective thing that I've seen to lower that. And it will do it. And there's some women, they're rare. I don't want to point this out as this is a big deal, but it's enough that uh, we do pay attention to this. 
Well, you know, it's interesting to me because, I mean, a lot of us don't know about sex hormone binding globulin. I didn't until I met you. I had no idea. I don't know why, but I didn't. Nobody told me. Um, and what interested me so much um, in what you're saying is that it is the body's innate wisdom to not allow for like free roaming, you know, run rampant hormones gone crazy wild in your body, but by the same token, it needs to be. I've never heard, I've never seen this particular image, free roaming, <laughs> going wild, but I, I get it. That's why I'm well, pausing. My own. <laughs> but this you sort get... of like a Halloween, this sort of like a Halloween thing. Yeah, it's a Halloween Q&A. We're, we're, sort of, we're sort of sensitized for Halloween. So you got these free roaming, wild, crazy hormones. Maybe throw ears. I don't know. I, like, you know, what the heck? Um, <laughs> our bodies are really amazing. And I want to really quickly take the time to welcome Elaine and Elizabeth, um, who has a pseudonym, ESP Summer. Um, Elaine again, Michelle. Uh, Michelle, Kim, and Joanne, and we will get to your questions. I'm really happy. We're both happy that you guys are here. Good morning. Um, our bodies are so incredibly amazing. And something that did concern me, it concerns you, is that when we see, you know, a lot of women, God bless, um, that they do. I understand it. Um, and hello, Michelle. Um, welcome women helping each other or trying to but they're all as you always say all of these moving parts sex hormone binding globulin is one of them we'll get into the the thyroids later but, let me keep it simple okay any woman going into menopause that's embarking upon a hormone treatment program should have when she gets her routine blood test an assessment of sex hormone binding globulin shbg SHBG. It, it took me a little while to figure out that acronym, but I did. Should we go um, to the next question? It's because I think you've got a load there. What we are going to do. So, um, okay, let me go to this one quickly and then I'll get to the, the more. Okay. Can we talk about how it is we might be able, because it's on the same lines, able to lower, excuse me, high cholesterol. And why it is that we get high cholesterol, I'm sorry, cortisol in the first place, not cholesterol, cortisol. Um, so it's about high cortisol and how we might lower high cortisol? Yeah. Can we talk about how it is sure. we might be able to lower high cortisol and why it is that we get high cortisol to begin with? Sure. Absolutely. Um, cortisol is the most important hormone in our entire body. It's the only one that should we produce zero or low amounts, we cannot live. You could remove someone's thyroid gland. They would have no thyroid hormone. We'd still live. They'd spend time and they spend all their time in bed, but cortisol, we cannot remove the adrenals because without cortisol, we cannot live. And, and it, it's coming out of the adrenal glands and it has a lot of natural functions. And uh, one of those functions uh, relates to the stress response, the biology of the stress response. So should a saber-toothed tiger or a wild creature from a Halloween resource bank come flying through this window right now, <laughs> my body is going to go into a major biological response if I get concerned about whatever that creature is. If I'm not concerned about it, it's going to be no big deal. But uh, and it triggers the biology of the fight or flight. And I mean, most people have heard about that. And there is a massive biology because human beings, moms have been known to lift cars off their children. Where did they get that power? They got it from the biology, the stress response. Uh, our primitive ancestors were known to flee or fight a saber tooth tiger. Some of them survived. They got extraordinary strength. How'd they get that? Well, there's a whole biology to the stress response and uh, at the vanguard, at the head of it is cortisol and adrenaline. Right. And interestingly enough, as a little sidebar, other energizing hormones are recruited for that stress response as well. For example, in women 
estrogens are recruited for the biology of that stress response. So are the androgens, like testosterone. This is a no fool around deal. And I won't go into the rest of the physiology of the stress response, but cortisol is the head of the pack. It elevates blood glucose. It suppresses the immune system. Immune system ordinarily takes a lot of energy. Yeah. To operate, as you know, when you got the flu and you're lying in bed all the time because your immune system has taken up all the energy, rightfully so. Well, right. we don't want the immune system active when a saber tooth tiger is leaped. So the, mm -hmm. the cortisol is part of the regulation of that. That's why it suppresses the immune system, or one of the reasons. And the uh, question was. <laughs> How is it that we... Um, oh, yeah. How do we deal with elevated? Well, okay, how do we well, lower let it? me give you the <laughs> challenge of dealing with elevated cortisol. It's a wonderful life mission to learn how to deal with elevated cortisol. You really have to get skillful at your emotions, mind, and life because what triggers this fight or flight? The biology is triggered by external or internal stress. And right. so the medicine becomes how skillful can you get when we encounter the stress of life? And the stress of life isn't going away. It's part of uh, our journey on earth. Stress really does a lot of important things for us. It's really one of the biggest spiritual growth motivators that exist. Is it how do we get home to more love, more consciousness, more golden ruleness? We get there by learning stuff, and the stresses of life are there are gurus. You don't nobody has to go to India to find a personal guru. Your spouse or your committed relationships or your work or your children or anything that matters or illness is, is gonna be your guru. And the, the trick is though. We want to respect and go do beautiful with these stresses of life. And we don't want to trigger the biology of the stress response repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. In order to do that, it's imperative to acquire skills that we were not taught in school. I wish we were. I think we should start in kindergarten or before that. The skills one requires is emotional skills and mental skills. It's becoming more conscious. The skill is that you become aware when you're feeling uncomfortable feelings and you do what those feelings inside of yourself need. So if you have a tremendous amount of fear, you get alert. It's important. And, and, and it's important that fear is very important and might wake you up to, oh my God, a dragon just flew on my window this Halloween. Oh my God, I've got to run <laughs> something. And but lock it happens it that fast. Like, That's right. Without your permission. But if it isn't a dragon or a saber-toothed tiger, right. it could be your own mind. Yes. You could, you could be having thoughts that aren't accurate. That's so They're true. old stories. Or it could be a relational issue or an economic issue or a work issue or a COVID issue or whatever is there. And it's in those moments that we want to do the right thing. And the very first thing is to do what those, um, those feelings need. They don't need you to go berserk. They don't need us to go get triggered and go wild into massive emotional pain. It's not helpful. And so often what gets triggered is not only the triggering event of the dragon who flew in this window, it's old fears, it's stored fears. And so the, getting the skills to, to recognize, oh my God, I'm feeling fear or I'm feeling sad, and to give that fear and sadness what it needs. And what does it need? It needs you to be conscious of it and feel it. Yes. Conscious of it and feel it. Conscious of it and feel it and breathe. Conscious of it and feel it and accept it. You're getting your arms around your own uncomfortable feelings and you're giving them what they need, which is called acceptance. Yes. And the mechanics of acceptance you're doing that acceptance as part of you learning unconditional love of your very own self. So where does it really bottom out unconditional love? It matters most in you being able to accept uncomfortable feelings. And if you do that, they're not going to cause you trouble. And you're going to be surprised how quickly away they're going to melt. 
And if you have issues to deal with, a communication to make this challenging or a decision to make this challenging, as you have been so skillful, as you've become your own mother or father, and you put your arms around and you accepted your uncomfortable feelings and you breathed and felt them, they do need to be felt, and you accepted them, you're going to be in the best position ever to navigate through the stressful situation you have. That's the short version. But why I went into some detail with it, because every other way to low, lower cortisol is artificial. <clears throat> why would you, and you know, your adrenal glands are ultimately going to lower cortisol. You keep pushing, you keep being unsuccessful with the biology, the stress response, and over-secreting cortisol, adrenaline, estrogen, testosterone. It's one of the reasons women wind up with lower hormone levels in their 20s and 30s, and men wind up with lower testosterone and can't get an erection in their 40s because they push themselves too hard because the adrenal gland is going to protect that cortisol above all other hormones. That means it's going to recruit everything it can in the biology, the stress response, you know, along with the cortisol. It's going to recruit the estrogen. It's going to recruit the testosterone. And, and, and those things will diminish. Young women, for example, who are in excessive stress, like a, training for Olympics, they're not menstruating anymore. They don't have enough estrogen to go down their right. female pathway. They, that estrogen <clears throat> is going down the stress pathway. That's how your body protects that cortisol. And that's why it doesn't necessarily lower so quickly. And then over time, your excessive response to stress, unenlightened, unacceptable response to stress, exaggerated response to stress is going to lower your cortisol. It's going to be the last one standing, but that'll lower it. Your body's going to lower it. Exhaustion's going to lower it. And some right. people have major adrenal fatigue. And rarely, we even have to treat patients with cortisol. Sorry for the length of this answer, no, but they no. asked the question. Now, there are supplements that are purported to change the uh, cycle of the cortisol that comes out at night. It's a great thing to not have it come out at night because it can. And some people do have it put out at night. It's supposed to come out in the morning to energize your day. I, I know what those supplements are, but I wanted to take you right to the mat and tell you this is what matters. Got it. Go Thank speak. You the information and tools go to iwonderdoctor.com look up anxiety yeah. and depression we introduced these tools and in 2020 we are so fortunate there are so many teachers that know so much about this and they're on the internet and you could learn everything you need to know about successful healing of uncomfortable feelings on the internet and look them up. They're all over the place. And I'm not going to give you the list now. Someday I might. But go fi find them. Type in emotions. You're gonna, there's so many books. There's so, and it's good information. This is different than back in 1968 when I was in medical school. You go seeking for information about emotions. You don't run into a great deal of stuff. You go seeking it today. It's fantastic. I, I would like to recommend Eckhart Tolle's New Earth. He talks about the pain body. I, yeah, I, I'd like yeah. to rec recommend Michael Singer. Um, he really understands emotional pain at the depth, and he describes it in his book very uh, deeply. And so do hundreds of others. So there you go. My minor question: How do you regulate lower cortisol? As, as is always. <laughs> As is always. All right, <laughs> I've got. I could talk to you for a hundred hours on that one. So, um, okay, the next one is going to be when a woman is in menopause with a with F -A F S H higher than 50, and she's starting both estradiol and progesterone, would you suggest starting the progesterone first to help prevent breast tenderness and then add in the E later once the P levels have increased? She, saying I, asked is that I see a lot of women uh, on more than one hormone um, at the same time, and they're complaining of breast tenderness. Thank you, she says. <laughs> now, I did answer this did yesterday you? in a, in a oh, Facebook okay. video. Um, here's what my request would be, that you go to our ins and outs and menopause page, 
and look at the video I posted yesterday, or it'll be posted this morning. I just notified the team that I did that yesterday. And I answered, I thought this was an excellent question. And it I, answered it, excellent. I answered it in a full video and it should appear today. Okay. Our team is so great. Okay. If it doesn't, let's save it for Tuesday. But I, I took on this very question and I answered it as the only question I did a video on yesterday. I apologize. I was running. I saw that you answered one, but I forgot. Which it may one? not have been posted yet by our team. I just okay. notified them this morning that I had answered that. All right. Well, thank you. Um, okay. Now, Elizabeth, um, I just I just ratted you out. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Can we please just? I haven't heard that term in a while, Carolyn Spiro. I know I a lot of new ones. <laughs> You're pulling um, somewhere in there. Yeah, like when I said I got busted by Doctor Blooming. <laughs> really. Um. I think you may have answered this one too, and I apologize. You're faster than I am. Um, can you? Can we talk a little bit about PCOS and perimenopause, and what to do? Unfortunately, I am not an expert on PCOS, and well, there's only one thing I want to say about it. Um, one is sometimes it's driven by something <clears throat> as simple slash not simple as excessive amounts of carbohydrate intake. The one woman that I treated successfully at PC, with PCOS with major acne and major female symptoms, and she was drinking eight Cokes a day. Yeah. And there is a connection between provocation from excessive simple carbohydrates and hormonal balance being thrown way off. And there are a certain percentage of women that the... Um, part of the remedy is and i don't want to hold it to be the total remedy is uh get rid of those simple carbohydrates no matter how challenging that is and i'm yeah, i apologize i'm just not an expert on pcos so uh, you know, I pass i pass on a question i well well um i have about six or seven young women here that do have pcos it is something i'm learning about i don't really want to put out my two cents too, too much, but um, it's not fun for a lot of women. It's painful. Uh, and Elizabeth, I'm a carb, a carb addict. I just saw that come in. There's yeah. reasons. I'm not going to call you a carbohydrate addict. I'm going to say that if you follow the bouncing ball, the reason that people usually consume excessive sweets slash excessive simple carbohydrates is there's reasons just like there's reasons and alcohol is reaching out for alcohol and gets addicted to alcohol or any addict does and here's what here's how i see it you're cruising along and you start feeling uncomfortably emotionally whether you're aware of that or not and you don't like it because not feeling well emotionally is something that's heavily judged by individuals for example when i say uncomfortable emotionally what i'm referring to is at first glance it might feel like anxiety or depression or you may not even notice it inside any anxiety and depression is a bottom line right it always comes down to when you investigate, when you burrow into anxiety and depression, you encounter fear, sadness, anger, shame, guilt, emptiness, loneliness, meaninglessness, hopelessness, and even, quote, death energy. Uh -huh. Something of that nature. The words don't matter. It, they're really uncomfortable feelings. And where did they come from? The majority of them, and most people who haven't done the heavy lifting, the work that's involved to heal that, is they're ancient. They're, they're in your cells. They're in your, your memory. They're, you came to earth with them. I'm not going to go into the origin so much as should you slip into one of those feelings and they're constantly trying to come up to the surface. That's what a healing process often does. You may try, you may have them successfully repressed, although that's an oxymoron. There's no such thing as <laughs> successful repression. Uh, but the feelings are 
constantly trying to come up. For what reason? They want you to become conscious of the uncomfortable feelings and do what the uncomfortable feelings need, which I described in one of those previous answers prior to PCOS. They want you to have skills to do the right thing. And if you do that, you're going to um, heal over time. That's the miracle of it. You're going to heal your emotions, your consciousness, your life, and you're going to become more and more of your own real self. Now, back to the simple carbohydrates. You've had a dip of mood. What what do a lot of people do? They do not know what to do with that dip of mood. They're not really present and conscious with what that dip of mood consists of, i.e. fear, sadness, anger, and they want to alter it. They want to medicate in there. And thus, the pharmaceutical industry has provided humanity with a ton of medications. Hey. That is suppressing the ability to heal, although I'd never want to say never. Sometimes those medications really help someone navigate. And I do appreciate the antidepressants and the antipsychotics and uh, the anti-anxiety pills. Sometimes they are really needed, and I'm a heavy supporter of them when they're really needed just to make it more life more manageable and thus you get to also do your healing they're not going to totally you know, wipe out wipe these things out and yet one of the more common things so common in human beings is to eat or drink and what do you eat what do you want to eat you want something you're low you want to get high so what works Simple carbohydrates, sweets, they work. For one thing, just the biology of them is that they raise your blood glucose. You get more energy. Oh, I feel better. Yeah, And they they raise your adrenaline and cortisol. Ooh, those are two anti-anxiety drugs. In fact, one of the reluctances of physicians to give people long-term cortisol or its uh, pharmaceutical analogs is people get addicted to them because they really like the high and it's tough to come off the high. So it's tough to get people off of prednisone that they've been on for a long time because they don't want to get low because they got high with the prednisone. Oh my God. So, but sugar is the same thing. It works. You get, you not only get high from the rapid metabolism and energy that you get from the sweet, because they are rapidly metabolized, they're rapidly absorbed and rapidly metabolized. You produce energy out of that. You trigger the cortisol and the adrenaline. And those are those will elevate that lousy mood as well. I was just going to say, don't you pay a price? <laughs> Pardon? Don't you pay a price? Yes, you do. Um, oh. You're going to, for one thing, you're bypassing the whole purpose of your body delivering up your uncomfortable feelings. For right. another thing, you're messing with your glucose regulating mechanism, <laughs> glucose, insulin, and eventually you become diabetic. Uh, that's the ultimate and so many folks in their 40s are gaining weight and gaining weight or should i mention gaining weight that they don't want because they've been messing with their glucose regulating mechanism for so long that their body can no longer manage glucose as glucose as well and it starts storing it as fat that's one of the prices you pay And you can go all the way to bigger issues around glucose insulin regulating mechanism. That's one of them. There's all kinds of other prices you pay. It's an excellent question, but let me go to the cure. It's acquire those skills and get so the emotional skills, the mental skills and get so conscious that when that um, emotional desire to have some sugar, arises you ask yourself a question because it's one of two things oh my god i haven't eaten since my excellent breakfast it's now four o'clock in the afternoon this drive for sugar is an emergency i've got to get on a regular schedule of eating i've got to get good nutritious food that i eat a breakfast lunch and dinner and maybe some good snacks in between because that'll trigger a hunger for glucose because that's the rapid response team because your body does not tolerate low glucose that's one thing could be dietary could be you're just skipping your meals that's not the most common thing the most common thing is you get conscious and you go oh my god i i'm just 
feeling so hungry. I gotta have the sugar. I gotta have the sugar. And you go, that's funny. I just ate, I just ate a really good breakfast an hour ago. Maybe it's something else. What am I feeling? So I'm going to pause with everybody here and I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and I'm going to ask you to check in and ask yourself the question, what am I feeling? Carolyn and I are going to go silent for a few seconds here. What am I feeling? What emotions am I feeling? And open your eyes. That's one of the techniques is you pause, you ask yourself what you're feeling. And even if you don't know what you're feeling, that's the beginning of the skill to get help you heal your uncomfortable feelings is you got to recognize them. And then, like I was hinting at earlier, or outright declaring, screaming to the moon, the Halloween moon, <laughs> to acquire the information, skills, support, groups, friends, colleagues, get it, uh, your friends are also dealing with this, whatever it takes acquire the emotional and mental skills and go, oh, look at this. I'm feeling fear. Well, I know what to do with fear. I'm just going to breathe and stay conscious of the fear. And I'm going to feel it. I'm going to breathe and feel it. And I'm giving you the short version. I go to IWonderDoctor.com look up anxiety and depression or go to the multitude of teachers and therapists who are skillful with this. Go into therapy. We have a, I have a dear friend who she's seeing a wonderful therapist that's just changing her life because she's getting these skills to deal with these deeper pains. That's how you break the carbohydrate addiction because <laughs> it's there for a reason. It's trying to mood elevate. And that means you've got a low mood why do you want to elevate? Because you're not feeling good. Well, inside of not feeling good is fear, sadness, anger, shame, guilt, emptiness, loneliness, meaningless, blah, blah, blah. and all you need I'm is the you. skills to, do, to do, deal successfully with it. I'm complete. Uh, wow. You know, yeah, I make mention of this and, and a lot of women don't want to hear it. And I, I don't think I much wanted to hear it either, but I will again go back to that meltdown i had when i barely knew you and that's exactly what you said to me shut your eyes and tell me what you're feeling and i was like petrified <laughs> you know? our team is uh, starting to flash questions yeah from the audience is it time to do that so I think it is. um you know we've got olivia here jules hi jules and you know hi. what happened is um our team in the background has selected out questions. So I'm going to start, I'm going to read them out loud and uh, go and, ahead and I'll save these for Tuesday. All righty. From Michelle. Yes. Hi, I'm on menopause and my GP won't give me HRT. I'm suffering really bad. My anxiety is through the roof. Yeah. And the great news is, is we've got the remedy. And unfortunately, Michelle, you're running into what is epidemic in the world of women and epidemic in the world of healthcare professionals. In 2002, a poison bomb was dropped called the Women's Health Initiative. It was wrong. It was the opposite of what was true, but the press got a hold of it and it exploded and declared that women who are treated with hormones are at greater risk for breast cancer, heart attack, and stroke. It wasn't even hormones. It happened to be PremPro, but I'm not going to go in that story. I've gone into it before, and it's in my book. Now, they were wrong. I was alarmed myself in 2002. I've been treating women for 10 years in, with hormones, bioidenticals. But I went into the bioidentical literature and was reassured, and I looked into the study itself, and I went, oh, my God, there's so many problems in this study. And in the study themselves, in, in the study itself, it reported in that study that was published, no one saw it, except those who were really paying attention and were really savvy. It said the increased in PremPro, the increased rate is actually statistically insignificant. Statistically, statistically insignificant in medicine means junk. It does, it's meaningless. It has no meaning whatsoever, but it was way too late. It exploded. And so now, 18 years later, What's the prevailing opinion when I encounter physicians and patients all over the place? 
It's still that if I take hormones, I'm at greater risk. Now let me tell you what the truth is. In 2000, it was known by 2006 that even that small, in, statistically insignificant increase had gone to one. That means there was no increase in risk. But you didn't hear see that published. Now many of us who had our feet to the railroad, our ear to the railroad track, follow that image. We're paying attention. We saw. Look at that. They they followed this group and it went to one. We knew it all along. It wasn't statistically significant. By 2017, the very same study committee that did the original Women's Health Initiative, published in the same journal of the American Medical Association, the, the, the Women's Health Initiative, they said, after 18 years of follow-up, I'm quoting, there is no increase in breast cancer, heart attack, and stroke. How many of you seen that? How many doctors have seen that? Very few, very small percentage. So when you go to your doctor and your doctor is concerned, you got to realize that Women all over the world and medical professionals who that's not their main thing, they got terrified too. And that's why you got that. But I'm going to recommend that you read the book written by an old family friend of Carolyn Shapiro. His yeah. name is Avram Blooming. And the book is called Estrogen Matters. And maybe you can flash that book in front of the screen, Carolyn. Yeah, um, you know, because, well, uh, I actually can do that. Dr. <laughs> Dr. Blooming and Dr. Tavris have written the gold standard um, rebuking of this and all the medical studies. And for those of you who want the medical studies, I'm telling you, you're in there. But here's what I want you to hear. We're all at risk for all kinds of diagnoses, thousands of diagnoses. I was grateful when I got up this morning and was thankful for the health I do have. I'm still walking and talking and uh, actually quite cruising, to, um, which is fun. <laughs> We and all at the same time, I am at risk for hundreds of diagnoses, thousands of them, including cancer. And as a male, I have an increased risk for prostate cancer. And women are at, have increased risk for breast cancer for, for reasons. When those of you who study breast cancer will know why there's it. But here's what you need to know. A woman who is treated with hormones, even Premarin and Prempro, which I've never written a prescription for, are at less risk for breast cancer, heart attack, and stroke than women who go untreated. So that's what I want you to think about. And then we have a webinar tonight. Check the link and I will give you the royal road, the golden path to for us to assist you through, well, I, I train and mentor physicians. This is what I do. I see patients still. Um, we can link you up and get you into a program where the best of the planet earth in my humble opinion non-humble that uh, you can receive to get treated um, the path is there and we welcome you and go to our webinar someone will put a link possibly in the chat room here that you can go to you can go to ins and outs and menopause there's a link to our thursday night webinar it's going to be at eight o'clock or nine o'clock let me tell you for sure five my time and I, you know what, um, Dr. Rosensweet, I just want to interject and really quickly say thank you. This is so valuable, this information. And, you know, we have the questions here, but when I'm up at, you know, 4 a.m., because I rise way before the sun is thinking about it, I am getting lots and lots and lots of private messages saying, thank you. How do we reach out? You know, this is really valuable information. We're very appreciative. Just as a shout out. Thank you. Not a rat out, but a shout Not out. A rat out. Okay. <laughs> and yes, it's 8 p.m. EST, 5 p.m. BST. And, you know, Michelle, Aww. there are so many women that go into menopause and they've been relatively healthy their whole lives and relatively doing a, a, a good job with the challenges of life. And then all of a sudden they start getting these wild out of the left field emotional symptoms like severe anxiety. There's biological reasons why that's happening too. And they should be addressed by excellent treatment of your cascading, losing, dropping, major feel-good stuff. How does, how does estrogen and progesterone and testosterone affect a woman's mood? Big time. 
get too low on those wonderful biochemicals. What is the biochemistry of feeling good, of not feeling anxiety? Boy, hormones are at the foreground because they're so strong. And then also in Carolyn's uh, original website, Ins and Outs of Menopause, you can download our book for no charge, the PDF and Kindle version of it, in, uh, Happy Healthy Hormones. So that'll give you a roadmap. I wrote that for women. It's in its fifth edition. I wanted women to get enough information. And here's what the information leads to. It's great to have it. It'll help you in your process. But you need to link up with a knowledgeable, experienced physician or nurse practitioner or prescribing compounding pharmacist or physician's assistant that really knows this stuff and really knows how to do it. And my favorite way to do it is through the menopause method. So tune into the webinar, connect with us. There is high probability of relief um, just by getting the hormones right. And you'll be so grateful to that anxiety because it's inspiring you to go after and correct this menopause, get it corrected. This is your major project. And then you're gonna have 10, 20, 30, 40 years of being grateful. And so many, there's so many great things. I'll, I'll address some of those things in the webinar tonight. Great question. Here's the next question from Joan. With a family history of breast cancer, how do I find a doc that truly understands hormones? I'm very cautious and untrusting. New York is a tough place to find anyone. Well, yes, it is. Um, you know, I must say in 2020, as advanced as we are with the internet and the ability to knock out our planet, excuse me, um, <laughs> it's not that easy to find someone who really is knowledgeable and experienced and excellent in treating women in menopause. And then throw in uh, treating a woman in menopause who's had breast, can breast cancer, that's even harder. But it's also doable. And I suggest that you come to that webinar tonight. There is something I'd like to tell you, Joan, is as Dr. Blooming documents with the medical literature, here's another wild uh, statement that happens to be what good science, good medical studies have revealed to us that women who've had breast cancer and have had that breast cancer treated properly are at an increased risk for recurrence than a young woman is to getting breast cancer. There is a higher risk of recurrence, but at the same time, the risk of recurrence is less if you are treated with hormones. Oh my God, even Premer and Prempro, which I would never recommend in this day and age, Women who are, had prior history of breast cancer were treated that breast cancer properly are at less risk for recurrence if you're treated with hormones than if you are not. So you should go forward. I would recommend that you read Estrogen Matters. I, I like to see that, that reassurance go deep into your backbone because you go, look at this. I mean, this, they're laying out the story here and uh, they're laying it out in great detail. It's been a great service to Dr. Blooming and Dr. Tavris. And you know, she didn't have one menopausal symptom, Dr. Yeah. Tavris. But yeah. she didn't like, like sloppy science. And boy, she jumped exactly. right Yep. So that's I where I begin. And uh, in our method, under the proper circumstances, we do treat women in, in uh, menopause who've had prior history of breast cancer. There's a little more to go through. and uh, But yes, go to the webinar tonight. This is one way to get this to happen. Over the years, I've treated very carefully, very selectively, women who've had breast cancer. I've treated, there's many, I've got women that are five, 10 years out. They was, that is way in their rear view uh, window, rear view mirror. Yeah. Next question from Jennifer. What do you think about low cortisol levels all my saliva cortisol is low and urine test all low and no reserve. Yeah. It's the toll that's taken by extraordinary stress 
with and having that stress there, there's not something wrong with you or wrong with the stress and sometimes i know that stress is egregious oh my god would we human beings face and would some people face uh, i'm not trying to diminish the intensity of that but even the most challenging of stresses and boy you know you could imagine what they are and some of you have experienced some of them um it's still can take a toll on you, even if your skill set is way up on navigating through that stress and not going into what gets triggered from ancient reservoirs within us. And, but the bottom line is the biology, if the stress goes on and on and on and on and on, eventually our glands can't keep up with it. And like I was mentioning earlier, that adrenal gland is the last resource. It's going to be the last to go. It's going to be protected. And that cortisol level is going to be protected. But I see a lot of low cortisols. And occasionally, I like to treat with cortisol. What I would suggest for you, Jennifer, is an expert. Someone in our residency program, for example. Because to treat with cortisol, you want an expert. And part of the menopause method is it includes assessing and treating with cortisol when it's necessary. Interestingly enough, there's a, there's a lot of women, the vast majority of women who test with low cortisol, and ordinarily I am definitely not a fan of salivary testing, but salivary testing can reveal low cortisol and low DHEA for specific reasons. And then of course you had, a, it was even on your urine but there's a lot of women who have low cortisol on their testing at the same time they've got really low because they're in the menopause for example i don't know where you are but they're in the menopause that means their estrogen their progesterone their testosterone is super low when we restore those ovarian hormones the cortisol returns to normal and 90 percent of the women who test low on cortisol in menopause, whether it's me treating or one of the residents that I, that I mentor, I say, just let's hold our horses. The woman's navigating okay. You restore to proper levels the estrogens, the progesterone, the testosterone, and the DHEA, and thyroid if necessary, and you're going to watch some magic that adrenal gland is going to recover and you're going to see that cortisol gradually find its way back into normal range. Now there are some women, so, so that's the main thing. That's the, that's the 80, 90% of the women who have low cortisol if they're in menopause. Now there are the 10, 15%. I mean, I'm just throwing those numbers out. And these are not exact figures that that cortisol is so low and their fatigue is so great. And there are other symptoms from low cortisol are so great that we want to treat with cortisol while replenishing all the other hormones. And we continue to monitor that cortisol as we go there, because as we're replenishing all the hormones and giving a woman cortisol, we do not keep the woman on the cortisol eternally because the vast majority of them recover totally. And we wanna watch that like a hawk because excessive cortisol is no picnic. So we watch it, so we test you. We test your cortisol every quarter, for example, and what, what we invariably see when you're getting all the rest of the hormones right, and the stress isn't outrageous, is we see the cortisol not only return to normal, and then we start titrating the woman down. We, we come off of cortisol gradually. We start titrating the woman down, and then she's not on cortisol. So the patients that I put on cortisol, they're rare, but they're there. I watch them. And we titrate them off and none of them are on long-term cortisol. Very, very good question. They're all good questions. Yes, they are. It's amazing. Um, here's a question from Jules. I went into menopause at the age of 42 after an enormous crisis. I'm taking estrogen, progesterone, DHEA, and testosterone. But my body feels like I have no sex. I feel nothing at all, and I mean nothing. Is this hormone related? As my doctor tells me, it's nothing to do with my hormones. My doctor tells me it's nothing to do with my hormones. This makes me feel re really sad. And that's this is from, and it's probably bad that you were trying to say. Yeah. 
the next time carolyn we can have um our team flash these questions to you and uh, and you, you can be asked i can see them oh okay good yeah i could see them all libido sexual drive don't give up hope for one thing you're going to hear me say this um, a thousand times <laughs> as long as i'm doing facebook or in, in recommending people getting hormones reasonable is not that hard although sometimes it is getting them excellent is a whole other universe there's a lot of women you give a little of this and a little of that and things get a little better or get better enough but that's not what good menopause management is because every woman is so individual right and to get her ideal balance and her optimal balance to replicate closely enough what her body loves and is used to, that's a whole other art. And that's why I keep saying to you, there's a lot of physicians out there treating women in menopause. They got these broad-based practices and, there's no, and, the, and menopause is a very small part of it. And there's no way that they can get great at it because they can't get their arms around all these topics that they're dealing with with patients every single day. And so well, it is a specialty, correct? Well, that's what we're working on. We're, yeah. we're trying to make it a board certified specialty, unlike every other branch of medicine, gastroenterology, neurology, orthopedic surgery, on and on and on and on, where there's board certified specialists. And these people go through rigorous training and mentoring programs. Yeah. This does not exist in the world of menopause with one exception. We in the menopause method have a residency program going. It is rigorous. And it takes a long time. It takes hundreds of patients before they get good at it. And I'm mentoring them on every single case in the beginning. And we have an educational series as well. Now, so what I'm saying is for the biology of libido, you got to get the hormones right. And it varies woman to woman. You know, you t women, it's more common knowledge these days that you got to get the testosterone right because that's going to relate most to the libido. And in some women, that's correct. But as I, t I teach our, our providers, libido, as far as hormones go, is related to every single hormone that you can name. And yes, sometimes the more prominent one, the more important one, as far as a woman's libido goes, is testosterone. Sometimes it's progesterone. I have a patient that her libido returns in a narrow range of treating with progesterone. If we give her too much progesterone, libido disappears. If we give her too little progesterone, libido disappears. We got to hit the pharmacological window for, um, for progesterone. And pharmacological window is a very interesting concept that I learned in medical school. And what it is, is there is an optimal zone for any medication or hormone that you can name. If you get too little, you ain't going to get what you need. And if you get too much, you're not going to get what you need. You had to hit the window. And it was never better illustrated than a, a woman who lives not too far from me, Wendy. She had, we had to get her progesterone right. It didn't mean we left out estrogens or, or testosterone or DHEA. No, we didn't. But, and there's some window, well, some women that all the hormones matter, but their estrogen levels really matter. And there's some women that their thyroid levels really matter. You got to get the, you always got to get the estrogens right, the testosterone right, the DHEA right, and the progesterone right. So don't give up on the biology. And then there is a, a whole issue around sexuality and intimacy and trust and the relationship you're in. And I pretty much ask a woman who's having libido issues, do you like and love and respect your husband? Do you snuggle at night? If they do, I go for that biology in spate because that's where the action usually is. Do not give up. There's, all, there's, there's oxytocin. There's all kinds of things that can be addressed. You know, if you had libido in your past and you lost it, you lost it because there's either life issues or you don't have your hormones balanced properly. And it's going into menopause at the age of 42 after an enormous crisis, want to get all those hormones right. So there we go. It, you know, it's a process and I, and I'm reading what Jules says and it almost makes me want to cry because I get it. She says like, I'm no longer a woman 
And I think that a lot of us feel like that. And Dr. Rosensweet, you're so dear because you are fully a man, <laughs> but you seem to really get this. And I know that. And we know that. And, um, you know, these doctors that you have trained, I, I've been fortunate enough to meet a few of them, and they're amazing. And I know you don't miss a beat. And I do have to interject something you said, and that is hang in there. Just hang yes, in sir. there. No, Sometimes really. it, yeah. You Sometimes know? it takes quite a while to sort some of these issues out. It does. You know, more than, you, you know, there's there's women that it's taken me a, a couple years. Now, there's it was benefit along the way, but to get everything so their body really liked it. And they say, and they say, and this is always the final answer. This is the thing we're always looking for is, oh my, I feel better. I'm myself again. That's the whole purpose of what we do, the menopause method. Oh my, I feel better. I am, I'm living proof of that. I am. And I'll never forget it. December 21st, 2018. And it took some tweaking and it took some this and it took some that, but nothing huge, huge, huge. Carolyn, would you read that next question there? Uh, the one from, jo well, uh, the one Children from Michelle, the one from Michelle. I don't see the one from Michelle. Okay, I'll read it. Okay. Is there is there anywhere in the UK where I can access the 24-hour oh. urine test? Yes, you can. And uh, this particular laboratory ships all over the um, all over the world. And um, you'd want some good information on how and when and where and how to do it. And of course, we are we've been communicating with women in the UK for quite a while. And it's just a matter of the, the time and energy that we've got going. We'd love to get into the UK, of course. And uh, periodically we, so listen, Michelle, contact our staff, go to support at menopausemethod.com because it's not only the 24 hour urine, you need the proper hormones, you need the guidance and the, from an expert practitioner. So we're working on the UK and we'd love to get in there. But now I'm going, to ask, I'm going to ask the rest of your question. Full hysterectomy five years ago. So, wow. I mean, here's what you need. And you probably know this. You need all the ovarian hormones. The estrogens, of course, I'm a major fan of bias. And please download our book and I explain what bias is. You also need testosterone. You also need DHEA. And you also need progesterone. So just to pause there. And you have psoriatic arthritis, too. Uh, on uh, whoops can't read that been told don't need anything but estrogel not true not true not true you need all of them the ovary produced all of those wonderful powerful hormones you need every one of them and you have edema here's what uh, you have swelling you know pain arthritis you need some progesterone you need what the ovary used to produce that you ovary used to produce royal, robust levels of estrogens, replenished bias, two of the estrogens, estriol and estradiol, progesterone. Oh my God, there's at one point in a woman's cycle, there's a hundred times more progesterone than there is the estrogens. Huh. I think the one female body likes progesterone maybe. Hmm. And that's with or without a uterus. I know what the common knowledge is. Read, read our book. And you can download it, the PDF or Kindle version, off of ins and outs of menopause. Testosterone, previously known as a male hormone, but I can tell you women need their testosterone. It's crucial. It's the loss of testosterone that leads to so many long-term issues, including assisted living facilities, canes, walkers, wheelchairs, diapers, nursing homes. That's, the, that's that loss of testosterone. That's how significant that is. And DHEA. You want to replenish all four of those, and you want an expert to do it. And um, yeah, so here's what we teach doctors. When a woman in menopause comes in with a list of symptoms, instead of doing intensive workup 
tests if you can, because doctors know how to do testing, 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 put a woman through uh, all kinds of things. Treat the menopause first and see what, if anything, is left. And I've seen women with severe joint pain, enough to take Oxycontin, that's a narcotic, drop the narcotic when they got back on, when they got their ovarian hormones replenished, because even severe joint pain, joint pain, enough to need a narcotic for pain alleviation, went away when the menopause was uh, properly treated. And I'm not saying your psoriatic arthritis is going to disappear, but I am saying high priority for you, get that menopause right. So read the book that we wrote because it's a roadmap for what needs to be done. And uh, let's see if you can get us into... Uh, Great Britain, really, by training, uh, by mentoring, and by putting a, a physician in Great Britain that wants to be in our residency program. And uh, there are pharmacies in Great Britain that are dispensing uh, bioidentical hormones. They're compounding them. And let's see. Like body hormones. It's, uh, oh my God, it's 11 o'clock. <laughs> we'll, go, we'll, go, we'll go a little bit longer we'll go to 11 15 today because the questions are coming in fast and furious they and really here, are yeah I here's think one from jerry the week. <laughs> here's one from jerry i am 54 years old 20 years total sermino sermeno surgical meno okay got it thank you carolyn you're welcome I see a nurse practitioner found through the menopause method. She has me on 80-20 bias, 0.5 milligrams AM and PM. Hmm. When you say 0.5 milligrams, not sure what you mean because the menopause method, you, I, I don't know if you're using the organic oil, so I'd like you to let us know because 0.5 milligrams may or may not be enough. It, it sounds more like a gel or a cream. I'm working on the progesterone, which my body does not like. Sometimes that happens. When you go 20 years without progesterone, there can be uh, challenges. And some women, we can't seem to get them back on progesterone. And uh, I don't make a big deal of it. We just, we just replenish what we can. I feel my estrogen is still low. It has dropped 30 points in the three months, unbiased. My nurse practitioner will not increase my dose because I am E-dominant. Is one milligram biased daily considered a low dose? Well, it sounds like a cream in a gel, and I'd have to do the math on it. And I, I and the if the ratio is eighty twenty, then twenty percent of that is zero point two milligrams is estradiol, and eighty percent, which is the estriol, and I'm doing it in my head here. Actually, I can help you maybe eight because eight tenths of a milligram. This is too low. It's, it's too low a dose for most women. It adds up to 0 0.3 milligrams of estradiol equivalent, doing it in my head, which I'm probably right. And average in my practice for the amount of estrogen a woman needs is somewhere between 0 0.8 and 2.6. Average in my practice is 1.7. So if I've done the math correctly, um, you're on uh, 0 0.3 milligrams of estradiol equivalent. Remember, 0 0.8 is the low end. And there's ways to get women in menopause with sufficient estrogen. And so, um, because if the nurse practitioner is related to the menopause method, then she can consult with me. And we are allowing some who didn't, who are not in the residency program to get some advice. And so she knows how to do that. So I ask her to do that, but that dose is too low. And estrogen dominant. <clears throat> well, what do you do with a woman? who cannot tolerate um, progesterone. And commonly you think, well, I don't want to give estrogen unless I can balance it with optimal progesterone. Well, oh, there is a path to get every woman's situation proper, including those who do not tolerate progesterone. So um, keep going with this one, Jerry. I would not stop here. All right. <clears throat> I have a question from Kathy. And if you don't mind, she says, Please. my challenge. Is that cool? Please go ahead. Um, uh, my challenge with progesterone seems to be sluggish bowel. Does that make sense? And I wonder how you would treat that. Yes, it does make sense. <laughs> <Imagine> Pro <that. clears throat> progesterone 
is the great relaxor. That's not true of almost every other hormone that you can name. They're all animators. They all participate in the fight or flight. They all stimulate, not progesterone. If I were to inject the ideal dose of progesterone into my veins or your veins or anyone's, if we got the dose right, we could be put, we could get relaxed so much we could be put to sleep and we could be put to sleep so deep that we could, surgery could be performed on us. That's how relaxing progesterone is. Relaxing, oi, uh, too much progesterone relaxing, too much relaxation can lead to some issues as every woman or as most every woman who's gotten pregnant knows. Because if you relax the lower esophageal sphincter, you can get reflux. If you relax the spine so much, as, which is very important to relax the ligaments during pregnancy so the pelvis can get more relaxed and can allow passage of a very large head, relatively speaking, everything relaxes and the bowels relax. And there are so many women in pregnancy that they get constipated. Well, there's a long list of good things to use to do when you get constipated. And maybe this is calling you to task because for example, just me alone, I, I must have a sufficient amount of fiber in my diet, which means a lot of vegetables, 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 their salads, steamed vegetables, they're loaded with fiber. And for me to have the kind of bowel movements that I love, that I think are fabulous bowel movements and frequent enough. But do you like them? I love them. <laughs> getting a little out there, I realize. I must have sufficient a number of vegetables and salads in my diet. And the flip side of that, if I have too much protein or I'm not digesting the protein, my bowels turn to glue because that's what protein is. I mean, protein turns to glue if it doesn't get properly digested. Well, how many adults have sufficient digestion? Very few. Right. We don't have the same digestive power we had as teenagers. So supplementing the digestive enzymes to make sure that you're digesting that protein and, and go to I Wonder Doctor. We give some clues on how to do that. Supplementing uh, hydrochloric acid uh, to digest protein and minerals. Sometimes that's needed. Exercise is very crucial. Adequate es uh, exercise is very crucial for adequate bowel movement. The list for constipation, and we have, and I wonder, doctor, whole section on constipation, you got to get it right. And you might, I don't know how many of those, uh, those, those issues you've got going right. Um, you, you've got it, you're, um, but if you go down that whole list, then you can start doing some promoters. If you've got that right, that whole list, excellent, which will last you for your whole life. And it just makes wonderful sense for everything within your body to do exactly what I said. And um, if you've got that whole list, well, one of my favorite ways to assist the bowels is what we call bowel tolerance supplements. That means you take a lot of them, you start low and you keep increasing until you you're, until your stools loosen up and then you get, then you back, back down. Well, magnesium, yeah, it's just bowel tolerance say. magnesium in a supplement form will do that. And we don't want the super absorbable magnesium for that. We love super absorbable magnesium, but not for that. We like something like a magnesium citrate or even a magnesium carbonate. I mean, that's what's, I think that's what's in the uh, magnesium. Epsom salts has a, a magnesium. I think it might be the sulfate. I'm sorry, but you want, you take magnesium to bowel tolerance. That means you pop a magnesium capsule from the health food store one an hour. Until you, until those, and you do that for several days and those bowels should pick up. <clears throat> Another thing that works really well like that is vitamin C. We need a tremendous amount of vitamin C optimally. So Linus Pauling, uh, the one who just alerted us so much to the benefits and importance of vitamin C, we, uh, we do vitamin C to bowel tolerance. So you take a gram of C uh, every hour. Sometimes some people need buffered C. That means not the ascorbic acid, acidic kind. So between 
bowel tolerance magnesium and bowel tolerance of the vitamin C and all those amazing things, exercise, adequate vegetables, adequate vegetables, and then some more vegetables, good digestion, chew your food, eat slowly, chew your food. The best digester is chewing that food, getting it really, really tiny. And then some of you are going to have to supplement or you're going to benefit from supplementing betaine hydrochloride and um, um, digestive enzymes. Go to iwonderdoctor.com, look up constipation. That's how you address it because you want that progesterone uh, for most of you who can tolerate it. And you may have to back off on dose. You, your dose may be too high. But yes, progesterone relaxes that bowel and can get some people constipated. <laughs> Nothing like it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Here's a question that uh, looks like it's going to take about 10 minutes to read. Okay, but I see some clues here, so I'm going in. I'm going in, team. Going in deep. 61-year-old female, postmenopausal, 10 years, started with static cream hormones, biased testosterone and progesterone. They took care of some of my symptoms, but not enough. Switched. And started receiving pellets, estrogen, testosterone. You really wanted to flash this at me. This will be the final question of the day. <laughs> estrogen, testosterone, and oral prometrium. And it restored menstruation. Oh. I personally want that cycle because I'm more comfortable knowing my uterus is shedding as naturally as possible. Mm. At some point, my doctor was uncomfortable with keeping me at the levels I felt good at. And she lowered my dosage. I started gaining weight after successfully losing all menopausal weight at the start of the pellets, lost hair, lost libido, and it threw my thyroid off. I then started a certain protocol that has robust levels of estrogen in it, not to name the name, with an excellent practitioner, and it took over a year to start my hormone receptors up and get a cycle again. Yeah, that's uh, receptors are always an issue. Year two, she moved me to a generic BHRT cream, and I'm still adjusting estrogen and had to go back to oral prometrium. Seemed like progesterone cream wasn't absorbing very well. Haven't started testosterone yet for fear of hair loss and other symptoms, and I'm very susceptible to DHT issues. Hoping to get better answers and insight on this hormone journey. Well, you know, every woman is an individual, and there are every single woman, the name of getting menopause right is to zero in on the details of every single woman. And it's very rare that an individual woman can't ultimately be solved with for all the challenges she's facing in menopause and hormone uh, changes by not really diving in and burrowing into the details of the estrogens, progesterone, testosterone, and DHEA, and thyroid. And by the way, I'm I failed to mention thyroid in the constipation issue. We sure want to make sure that that's right. Make sure that you're getting your FSA, I'm sorry, your TSH, free T3, free T4, and reverse T3 um, evaluated. Sorry, jump back to a previous question. And what I, I I've seen every, so many things. And 90% of the time, it's possible to restore and replenish a woman in menopause hormone levels to optimal levels. And um, they fall within menopausal optimal range. For example, a young woman who's having a period is producing a certain amount of estrogen coming out of her ovaries. Let's say that much. This would be the low end for women. This would be the high end because women vary woman to woman, but somewhere in this optimal zone for a 20 year old, let's say, <clears throat> it takes a robust amount of estrogen to get a period. Estrogen to get a period. It doesn't take progesterone, testosterone, or DHEA to get a period. It takes a certain amount of estrogen. Now I'm going to assert that 90 Five, 99% of menopausal women do not need that robust amount of estrogen. They can get everything they want and need from this amount of estrogen. Notice I didn't say 100%. <clears throat> and there's reasons 
for this amount of estrogen. That's one zone less than what a 20 year old needs to get a period. Every single menstrual cycle, a woman prepares for pregnancy and lactation. Oh my God. A woman prepares every single menstrual cycle for breastfeeding. You'd think that would be not needed to be started up until she actually got pregnant, but that's not what the design is. In the beginning of every cycle, there's a certain estrogen receptor site called estrogen receptor site alpha. Fasten your seat belts, please. Mm. I go through this in my book. Estrogen receptor site alpha that guides the preparation for ovulation, for the forming of the endometrial lining, and even starts the lactation preparation going. Estrogen receptor site alpha, amongst its many functions, stimulates breast glandular cell, replication, mitosis, cell division, additional cells, interview most healthy young women who are menstruating very regularly. And they're going to tell you that their breasts get fuller as the period goes on, as the cycle goes on. And then if they don't get pregnant, the breasts retreat back to a smaller size. That's actual cells. Those cells got there by cell division. Now, Let's go back to what's optimal for a menopausal woman because there's you can give an, a menopausal woman enough estrogen to retain her menstrual cycle so she never stops menstruating or restore her menstrual cycle. You can do it. Here's a sneak preview that most people who are doing this method do not know. And I'm going to tell it to you. In order to retain a menstrual cycle or restore one that's no longer occurring, you need between three and eight times the upper limit of normal of estrogens that a young woman has. Not three to eight times the median, three to eight times the upper limit of normal of what a young woman, a 20-year-old is putting out. She's at the peak of her hormone production. Three to eight times that amount. How do I know that? Because I tested women on this particular method of treating women in menopause, that of bringing the period back. Well, what does that make a woman vulnerable to? Breast glandular cell proliferation. Well, I'm not a fan, not because it's up to me, but because of the medicine that I know. I think it's not a good idea to put a um, uh, a 50-year-old, for example, or a 60-year-old menopausal woman through breast glandular cell proliferation, through mitosis. 20-year-olds' immune systems are much better, <coughs> much more capable of handling, for example, a mutation that occurs during mitosis. That's when the DNA is most vulnerable to mutations. That's when the gene is most vulnerable to it, when, it, when the cell is dividing. Now, this was not my opinion. I did not originate this. Uh, a, a quite remarkable um, gynecologist published this years and years and years ago when that cycling way to approach menopause first developed. And he, he showed the histology, showed the dividing cells. His name is Alan Altman. Look him up. He was on the staff of Yale or Princeton. I'm very sorry. He was a, a staff gynecologist at a university. And he makes the best case for not putting elderly women through mitosis, older women through mitosis. And I can't tell you the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of women I've treated with the lesser amount, sub youthful, this level, because that's where they come in. They get, they are happy. They are delighted. Their vagina is protected. Their bladder is protected. Their muscles are protected. Their bones are protected. We know what those numbers are. I'm one of the physicians that dived in the medical literature to correlate it with the 24-hour urine hormone test. What's the right amount? And most everything that a woman wants is restored by this. This is the youthful. This zone. Not too little. 
but I say not too much to put a woman at risk for breast, breast glands or cell proliferation. The bottom line in medicine and in menopause medicine is do no harm. Do not put a woman unnecessarily at risk for breast gland or cell proliferation. Have I mentioned that? <laughs> now, um, the other hormones, they've all got their optimal zone too. And you never say never in medicine. So I'm sitting down in Washington, D.C. at Please. the National, Ac National Academy of Science, Engineering and Medicine at their committee to examine or to uh, give difficulty to the world of compound and bioidentical hormones. And I'm about to testify and our panel is going gonna, is gonna to pick up in five minutes right after the coffee break. I'm already down, ready, poised to go. And a physician sat down next to me, a, a physician in her mid fifties, I'm sorry, in, in, in her mid sixties. And before I went to Washington to testify, I did research on who was going to be on my committee. And I learned that this uh, woman was still having periods. She was using that method. And um, as she's sitting down and introducing herself to me, bless her heart, she's an amazing human being. I look at her and I say, are you going to mention that you're on that period restoring protocol? Because I knew that it was a bone of contention that traditional physicians have against compounded bioidenticals. I hope your this story is not too overwhelming. I told you when I looked at that question that um, that was uh, there was a lot there, and uh, she she winked at me, and as she's sitting down, she says no. Her presentation was going to be something else, and I went out to lunch with her and her son, and she told me this story that her mom had dementia and her mom's sister had dementia. And when she was in her mid fifties, she's a practicing physician with her own private practice. She's starting to not think clearly. She's starting to get cognitive decline. And uh, she said it would really freaked her out. She had reached the point where she said, I'm gonna have to stop practicing medicine. I can't, I can't remember this. I can't remember that. I'm not re even remembering what I'm supposed to do here. And she said she started, she knew that estrogen related to cognition and she knew that some women needed more estrogen to get that cognition back. And when I defined this zone, this the low end of this is enough estrogen to protect your vagina and protect your bones, right out of the medical literature. But it doesn't include sufficient amount of estrogen to restore cognition if a woman's having trouble. But 90% but of the time, that amount of estrogen that protects the bones and the vagina will restore cognitive function to a woman's satisfaction. But the medical literature is very clear that in some women it needs more and someone needs a lot more. And this doctor finally wound up on a, a mental clearing and cognition restoring uh, amount of estrogen and her period came back. And I'm sitting there listening to that and I'm not mentioning this SHBG problems and I have tears in my eyes because it's very moving to hear from a human being who thought they were heading towards dementia, let alone a doctor, um, the, the medical professionals from janitors in hospitals through uh, brain surgeons. These are my, this is my tribe. This is, this is a special, I have a special sacred connection with these folks. And I, I to, to hear her story that was that personal and I was that up close, I said, bravo. So you never say never in, med in menopause, in medicine, ever. Paradoxes. I, I salute her and she's on our coalition to protect bioidenticals. She's a dynamic, amazing physician. Wanda, hello. Should you be watching this? And you're in Washington, D.C. Um, Wanda is Wanda is seeing patients in that area. Wanda is special. <laughs> yes, she is. Yes, she and is. so, yeah, there's, and this, what does this take me to? Every woman needs to be individualized. And if, for example, I'm going back to your question, if you're susceptible to excessive DHT, then someone wasn't monitoring your testosterone. Because if you were young and you didn't have hair loss, you did have testosterone. Someone wasn't watching the farm there. And you got into too much testosterone. But that doesn't mean that you want to eliminate testosterone. I don't know if you did or not. 
Oh yes, you haven't started testosterone. You just want to get it right. If you if you produce too much testosterone, if you have too much testosterone, or you're especially sensitive to DHT production, it's a dose thing. When you were young, you had the right amount of testosterone and a rather robust amount when you were young, and your body knew how to process it then. So it was a dosage issue, and that's one of my problems with the pellets and a lot of these methods is. They're not monitoring with the 24-hour urine hormone test. They don't know what the optimal ranges are. So don't leave out testosterone or DHEA. Just get it spot on. And uh, anyway, amazing question. I'm, I'm glad to uh, handle the tough ones. And this was the last question. So I'm going to say happy Halloween because Carolyn reminded me that it's Halloween. And Gary, you, Gary. You, you, tell, you say, you take us on out, Carolyn. And you all you, it, when, let me say one other thing. We invite you to the webinar. Hopefully our staff has put a link to that webinar. We'll have one in the ins and outs of meta, menopause because this is your path or a path to hooking up with an expert and getting expert uh, treatment for your menopause. And that goes on at eight o'clock Eastern, five o'clock Pacific. And, it's a really good webinar. And, um, you know, I'm thinking back on my um, page and you and our interviews that we did that we will do again, but we used to do and telling women, telling women, telling women, please, please, please see I wonder doctor.com. Please, please, please see the menopause method, you know. Um, and it's all come to be and it it almost brings tears to my eyes because um you're a special man and um we're so lucky all of us truly it 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 yeah it takes a tribe it takes a team it takes a million but it can sometimes take just one to absolutely change your life in ways that are amazing and with you being you how can you know that dr rosen sweet you know what I mean? <laughs> Unless you tell it to yourself in the mirror every day. It's a good affirmation, I suppose. <laughs> I'm very grateful to all the women here. I'm grateful to Andre. I'm grateful to you. I'm grateful to myself, my little kitties, Halloween. And thanks for putting up with my cats, you guys. Um, and we're going to be doing this again on Tuesday and the following Thursday. And we'll get more questions and you know, whatever. Thank you, everybody, for every all the kind words that you're saying. It's amazing. So I guess that it's time for goodbye. What was that, Hobo Kelly with the magic mirror or whatever? <laughs> See you on Tuesday, those of you who want to join us. Yes, and for tonight's webinar. So God bless to everybody. Have a safe and wonderful day. Thank you, Dr. R. And we will see everybody later. Get with me during the day. You know where to reach me. And I'll get back to you. Bye.